The originals are better? Oh, definitely not. The originals are definitely not better. That is that is definitely that is definitely fake news. Definitely, definitely fake news. No, no way they're fake news. So what's going on? Right. So as we know, the biggest story yesterday is that the the fake news media is just triggered that Cassandra Fairbanks has filed a lawsuit against. Ah! Oh, that's loud has filed a lawsuit against a dishonest fake news journalist for spreading dishonest fake news. Oh, it's a threat to democracy and, and everything like this. Now, they're trying to misrepresent what I claimed. So now they're lying about me, they're lying about Cassandra, and you shouldn't talk about pending litigation, but I'm not suing anybody. A lot of people go, Senator Mitch, why don't you, why aren't you suing? Why aren't you suing? Guys, I'm so used to getting lied about I am so used to being, they've called me everything, and I'm just used to it. Maybe I should sue. Maybe, maybe I should sue when they're calling a man with a Persian wife and a half-Persian daughter a neo-Nazi, and then they're saying it's okay to punch neo-Nazis. Maybe, maybe I should, but I'm just, I get, they, they lie, lie about me all the time, man. The New York Times actually removed his public editor. Which, which really is, truly really is amazing. So the New York Times used to have a public editor that when they lied about you or did something wrong, you could have some form of redress. You could do some kind, you could have some kind of person you talk to. They don't even have a public editor. So if the fake news, I mean, think about this, right? If, okay, here I got, I got a Bose, product plug, not sponsored. Maybe I should, maybe I should start like lying. Maybe I should say Bose is sponsoring me, and then all the fake news people are going to email Bose and say, how can you sponsor Cernovich? Bo and then Bose will say, well, we're not really sponsoring him, and that can come like a story. But I don't need to do that. I don't need to make stuff up. There is so much news that I'm breaking every day. But I kind of – stuff like that to me is just kind of fun because – because they're so dishonest. Hold on. Let me, let me get this live thing going on here. So yeah, I'm I'm so used I'm so used to dishonest media and lies and frauds and everything like this that I don't know I'm I'm just jaded I guess I I, I was actually thinking today about something kind of weird which is that I don't it used to be that I thought the media was biased I don't even think what they're saying is true now so it used to be that I would think. Uh, you know, there's a liberal slant to this. There's a liberal slant to this article or whatever. But I didn't actually believe it was completely fabricated. Right? Now I just think, I assume it's all fabricated. The whole idea that if you went like that, that that was somehow a, you know, a, a racist Nazi thing or whatever, that's such a, that's so fake, right? It's, it's clearly fabrication. And now what I like is they're trying to say, people are saying the lawsuit's frivolous, which is, oh, no, they're not lawyers. Oh, they're not. Anybody claiming that Cassandra, Cassandra's lawsuit is without merit is complete fraud. It's a strong lawsuit. Because if that, I don't know who's that Emma girl. I don't know the girl's name, um, the fake news person. If she knew that this was not actually a white power sign, they lose the lawsuit, right? If she knew, if she knew, and that is going to be co covered in discovery. So they're trying to say, oh, it's a, no, it isn't. No, it, nobody fucking thought this is white power. Nobody thinks this is a white power symbol. Everybody who's claiming that is lying. They're fabricating their fraud. Or they are so incompetent that they shouldn't be allowed to work in media. Right? One of two things is true. If you think this is a white power sign, you are either lying or you're unfit to work in media. There's no other answer. There's no other answer. You're either lying to try to, to libel somebody, to defame someone, or, or what? Or you shouldn't be allowed to work in journalism. You, shouldn't, you should just be fired from your job. Like, wait a minute, idiot. Did you fact check it? 
what I think is funny is that Fusion is going to defend this person, uh, the Emma, whatever. So Fusion is going to defend this Emma person, which is really just a way of saying Fusion is admitting now they're fake news because Fusion should have fired her. Fusion should have said, here's, here's, here's the way real media would work. Here's the way real media. And if you think this is 666, then just leave because I don't want you around either, okay? I've been cleaning the house. A lot of people, I got a clean house. If you think this is a white power or that this is a satanic 666 symbol, go, leave. Because I don't want you reading my stuff. I don't want you anywhere near me. You're a kook. And I've been cleaning the house and getting rid of the kooks. Because you cause more harm and you don't do any good. So just leave. I don't need you here. Don't need you watching. Don't need you listening, reading, or anything. You're just, you're, you're a kook. And I got enough things going on in my life without that, all right? You sit around the devil sign. Yeah, sure, sure thing. Now, now, if you put it over your eye, that's a different thing, right? If you put it over your eye, you know, there, there's, there is Illuminati symbolism out there. But it, it isn't this. It is when you do that and you put it over your eye in a certain way. So you don't even know what you're talking about. You're just a kook. There, there is a way to turn it into that. But that isn't it. I don't need any kooks. No kooks allowed, guys. Kooks, what, the reason you can't have kooks around are that kooks do dumb things that get blamed to me, right? So if I foster an environment where kooks are allowed to be around me and then one of these kooks does something kooky, I'm going to get blamed for it. So there's no upside for me. I don't need a few more page views. My page, I did 163 million views on Twitter last month. 163 mil just on Twitter, right? I don't need any more page views. I don't need any more views. I don't need any kooks. If I have to have kooks who think that this is satanic and that I'm really a Satanist, then please don't think you need, need it. And not, I don't sell advertising. What were we saying? Oh, yeah. So if you think that this is a white power sign, you're either lying or you are incompetent. You shouldn't be allowed to be a journalist. So what is going on with that? Well, here's what happened with Cassandra. Cassandra is a good human being. I like to think of myself as a good human being, but I have a thick skin too. So me, I am used to every time, every day, there – Cernovich is a rapist, a racist, a misogynist, a neo-Nazi, a white nationalist, a white power, a black power, a Muslim power. He's part of ISIS. He, every day of my life, I'm just used to it. I'm so, like, I don't care, right? How would I sue for defamation? I can't, how am I going to claim emotional distress? What am I going to say, oh, my God, I'm emotionally distressed that, you know, people call me this stuff? Like, I think it's hilarious, right? So I have no lawsuit. I can't win. Because they would just clip this and say, Cernovich thought it was funny. And I would say, you're gosh darn right it is. I think it's hilarious that you people are morons and you continue to spread yourself. But that, what happened is that that Emma person wrote that fake news article. Then the independent, here's how, here's how fake news works. Okay. This Emma person, fake news person, puts a fake news thing. Oh, my God, white power sign in the White House. Can you believe it? And then the Independent, which is based in the UK, they'll say, according to Emma, this is a white power sign. But the only thing people remember is that, you know, white power. So then the Independent tries to hide behind the fake news lie on Twitter, right? Who's saying stop? Blocked. Anybody telling me what to do ever in my streams is an automatic block. Don't tell me to stop. Don't tell me you don't want me to talk about it. Don't tell me to talk about something else. Blocked. Heard your opportunity to widen your ability. Blocked. I don't need advice. I don't need advice. I need advice on, I have too many people. I have too many people who read me, listen to me, watch me. Can't even keep up. So I don't need advice on how to widen my, should I be more boring? You know how I can widen my audience? Hi. Oh, I'm very serious, you know. And then I just lie, like the fake news. Here's, here's how to, you know, why the, hello. I'm a true conservative, and I support Mitt Romney. 
why, yes, I'm a very good Republican. But I, I don't want to. My audience is already too big. So if you don't like the con, just leave. I don't need any advice from anybody. Especially when people have told me your brand is dead for like two years. Cernovich, don't talk about politics. Only talk about mindset. Cernovich, don't talk about Trump. Don't talk about that. Don't, don't be a cuck. Don't do that. Every way, everybody's telling me what to do for years. Meanwhile, right? I can't even keep up. So all I've heard nonstop for years is, Cernovich, this is what you need to do. If I listen to people, go, you go do it. If you can do Mike Cernovich better than Mike Cernovich can do Mike Cernovich, go do your own thing. Go do your own thing. Right? Don't tell me what to do. You're not the boss. I'm going to go live with Jeff. We're going to talk about the big event. The big event. But before we do, look, have a little empathy for – I mean, let me tell you the real life of Mike Cernovich. If you or anybody but me, tell me if this would be emotionally distressing. Imagine that you're married and you have a husband, you have a wife, and you have a family. Now imagine an article calling you white power was circulated to your family and to your wife's parents. Because that happened to me. Shauna's parents go, Hey, did you see this article? They say Mike is a neo-Nazi, and it was being sent to them by their friends. For most people, that's like bad, right? For most people, your wife is like, yeah, my parents are asking if you're a Nazi because there's an article in The Independent calling you a Nazi, and now they're relative. It's all this drama. So then her parents have to explain to, you know, Shauna's un uncle and aunt that I'm not really a neo-Nazi. That's a fake news lie. It sucks, man. It definitely, it isn't fun. These aren't fun cop. This is just me. This is my life. Every day of my life, it's just, you, you just take it for granted now. I take it for granted now that Shauna's going to have to tell her parents, no, 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 and her parents, they finally understood. It took them like two or three years because people would constantly be like, oh, yeah, you know, Cernovich is this, and yeah, this it sucks, dude. It isn't fun. Well, it, it is now, but it isn't fun for most people, and that's why most people can't do what I do. Is you're, yeah, you're, so half of Shauna's family would talk to her parents like, hey, I didn't know Cernovich was a leader of the Nazis, you know? What's going on? And then Shauna has to explain it. It isn't cool, guys. It isn't fun. It really isn't. I can choose to have fun with it because, it, to me, that's a measure of influence. But you still have to rewire your brain, right? I'm a normal human being like the rest of you. I'm sensitive. I have emotions. I want people to know who I truly am. I want to live an authentic life and have people recognize who I am and not who I'm not. I have every human need that you have, right? But if you're going to do what I do for a living, you have to rewire your brain. So when people are, you know, when relatives are telling Shauna's parents that Cernovich is leading a Nazi group, for most people, that's going to suck. And for me, I just go, well, that shows how much influence I have that people all around the world are sending articles to Shauna's family. Wow, this is amazing. Right? But that's what you have to tell yourself. Because the alternative is like, well, that sucks. You know, like, this is awkward. But when you rewire your brain, like a teaching gorilla mindset, is you just say, wow, isn't it amazing that – People in Canada are reading articles about Mike Cernovich and then sending them to Shauna's family. This is incredible. That is how far the message is getting out. The reach is expanding. I can't believe it. This is exciting, right? But let's be real. It fucking sucks, man. Those aren't fun conversations to have. It isn't fun when people lie about you and then you have to explain to people why those are lies. But it's life, man. I'm not going to martyr myself. So for Cassandra, she wasn't used to that. That article, defaming her, defaming me, was the number one article on the independent website. It had over 100 million views worldwide. Once you factor in Facebook, social media. Think, I mean, think about that, right? We were the number one story in all of Europe. 100 million views across the independent and Twitter and social media and everything. How would you feel 100 million people are lying about you about anything, right? Just imagine 100 million people were lying about you about anything in your life, and then imagine they're lying about you calling you a terrible person, right? 
I'm, I think for me, again, I know how to reframe it. And I think, wow, 100 million people are receiving the message, the powerful message of Mike Cernovich and Gorilla Mindset. This is amazing. I can't believe it. We've come so far. Like, this is fantastic, right? But that's kind of bullshit, you know? A lot of what you got to do in life is you have to learn how to brainwash yourself, right? A lot of what I do is, dude, it fucking sucks, right? There are people around the world who want to murder me for who I'm not. If people want to murder me for who I am, then I don't really have a problem with that. There are people in this world, in this country, they want to murder me because they think I'm a neo-Nazi leader. There's nothing cool about that. There's nothing cool about that. But if you reframe it and rewire your brain and how you think about it, then you go, well, this is spectacular. You know, this is great. This is reach. This is influence. For every person out there who hates me, there's a hundred people who love me, but they're never going to say anything because people are more likely to complain than they're not. We're having an impact on the world, millions of people worldwide, right? But you have to rewire your brain. And it takes, you know, that's why I wrote a whole book on it. You just don't do this stuff overnight. All right, hold on. I'm going to invite Jeff on. We're going to get Jeff on. Hold on here. So Jeff and I are planning a big event. Hold on, let me, what is it? You know, Google for all of its, oh, this is so annoying, dude. Google for all of its merges is definitely. Jeff and I are planning a big event. So let me, let me get Jeff on. We thought we were going to have it in October, but that doesn't look likely now. Looks like we're going to have it in February. So hold on, let me get, let me get, send this email out. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button. If you're on YouTube, if you're on YouTube, hit the like, whew, it's getting hot here, I'm getting fired up. Yeah, if you're on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you're on Periscope, I feel like this dude doesn't have a degree in journalism. Because I have a law degree. A degree in journalism, first of all, degrees don't mean anything. So if you don't have a degree, don't feel that you're less of a person, right? That said, dude, I got a law degree published constitutional law scholar what in the world could I learn in journalism school and get out of here you want to if you want to measure degrees if you want to really get into that then I'm way more qualified than anybody in journalism I'm the most qualified journalist today in all of America all right we got Jeff on let's see if we can get we'll talk about the big event all right, Mike Jack, just say something, Jeff. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Oh, boom. Okay, welcome. How's it going, man? How's it going, man? Good, dude. I'm just trying to get the, the Periscope here fired up. So smash that like button on YouTube. We got Jeff DC on the line. By the way, Bilderberg is, Bilderberg I hear is an in echo, here. An echo. Yeah, I know, because you're on the Bose speaker. Is there any way, is there any way you can... Get me off. Get me off. Okay. How about now? Let's uh, Let's, test uh, one, testing two, one, two, three. Now. Now. You still echo? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, then we'll try a different way. All right. Try now. Testing one, two, three. Much better. Thank you. Um, how's it going, Mike? So now I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Yeah, that's Te funny. So now I can't hear you. Let's try. All right, talk again. Mic check. Te testing one, two, three. Incredible. So let me let me check the preferences here. Technical technical difficulties. All right, hang up and call me back. Let's try that. Okay. We're working on it, guys. Technical difficulties. I'll have a real studio here. Trust me, I'll have a real studio soon.
Hey. Testing one, two, three. It takes time, man. It costs a lot of money too. And I am not I don't have any investors or anything like that. So everything Testing I do one. is just kinda like me. There's no Testing right, one. So you're there and I see you, but I can't hear you. This is really perplexing. Hmm. So audio HD is on. Hello? Testing one, two, three. Audio's on. Two, three. Settings. No. All speakers. Hey. No. Okay, we got you now. Can you hear me? We got you. We can hear you now. Okay, so we're okay. I'm taking you live on Paris. All right. So if you're on YouTube, you just watch me play with the tech. And we're back. Mike from DangerPlay.com, Brill Mindset. We have the Deplorable event co organizer, the Bull Moose Party event co organizer. He's actually more the organizer. I'm just the marketing guy. So it's actually more, more accurate to say he's the organizer. I'm just, I just tweet a few things. So we, we were talking about a big event that we were going to do. So lead the way. What's going on? Yeah. So first, Mike, uh, fantastic job. I caught you a little bit on Alex Jones. If you guys aren't watching Mike on that, check it out. He's he's phenomenal. Um, I never watched Infowars before, to be perfectly honest, until you got on, Mike. So you're you're converting me. I'm almost at the point of buying caveman pills or whatever um, to take to my yoga studio and trigger the woman who who made a nasty comment about Trump this morning. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, so back to the event. So just to set the stage for this, you know, so, so take a step back, everybody. We won the election, and I think, like, Mike, I remember you had a Periscope or a YouTube where you're like, I'm done. I'm going to write, get back to writing mindset books and all this stuff. And then we, we saw what a fight it was going into the inauguration. And we realized, I think, I think kind of we had a conversation about this at the same time, you know, the election was just the warm-up. The election was just the warm up. This fight is going to continue, and this movement that was created through the Trump movement is really just beginning. And we've done phenomenal job on social media. You know, the work that you do every day and a number of other people to kind of counter the media narrative has been phenomenal. And now we're at the point of converting that into real political power. And one of the things that we've learned is really effective for our movement is doing live events, building a canvas and bringing people together. And so as Mike and I were brainstorming power moves, high leverage power moves to start to build political power and momentum, the idea of doing a big event and specifically a competitor to CPAC came up. And so that's really our vision is to, you know, is to build a, an event that kicks CPAC's ass, frankly. Um, so that's what we're brainstorming. And right, we want so, you guys to be a part of it. Yeah, exactly. So for those of you who are new and you're not used to this, um, we did a while ago, like we're not going to whiteboard it right now because I don't have it set up, but what we like to do is we are big believers in, you know, right now we have 1,500 people watching. So it's kind of stupid to say, oh, I'm glad 1,500 people watch, 2,000 watch, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people are going to watch. Um, but we're not going to ask you anything. We're just going to tell you the way it's going to be, and you better listen to us because we're the elite, and you know we got the fancy degrees, and you people are, you know, nothing. That that's not what the Trump movement is about. So, what we like to do is we want to be like, well, what kind of event do you want? What kind of events do you go to? How can we take it over together? That's the power of the Trump movement. Is that it's a populist revolt against the elite governing and so i'll tell you where jeff and i kind of were and then those of you jeff can read the comments he'll be reading your comments so i'll tell you where we were and then what happened initially we were going to have a big event planned in june which in hindsight is kind of like laughable hey think big though you know definitely um you know think big but it's kind of laughable we were like oh hey why don't we have a big event We'll do it in June. It'll cost us, you know, six figures to put up. Hey, no problem, man. You know, the deplorable and everything. And then what happened, Jeff? Yeah. So then it was like, hey, let's just do an event and let's do maybe a one-day event and let's do it in June, have a bias towards action and getting it done. And then we looked into doing that. We realized, you know what, if we're going to 
the economics of it didn't work out work, frankly. You know, I crunched the numbers and spreadsheet of the whole thing. Didn't make sense for one day. So talked to a bunch of different people about, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And we realized that, you know, at, I think it was at that point we were like, you know what, we, we need to compete with CPAC. We need to displace CPAC as the main conference for the right. And then our eyes got kind of bigger. So what does that mean? Well, that means we need to do a multi-day event. That means we need to make our vision more people rather than fewer people and really set the stage for doing an annual event that repeats itself uh, time after time. So then we realized, geez, that takes a lot longer. What's the, when's the soonest that we could do that type of event? And at first we thought, geez, could we do it on a six month timeline? That's about half of the time it normally takes. Normally it takes a year for these. And we looked at different venues and got an event management company that's really experienced. And we realized there aren't any venues really for us in October and that we'd be kind of insane to do it on that short of a timeline. So now we're looking at doing something next year, um, ideally early next year. We've identified six different venues here in Washington, DC. We're checking their availability. We have a highly, highly professional event management company. We just got the contract to work with them today, so we haven't signed it yet. So one of our next steps is to look at that contract and make decisions about whether we wanna pull the trigger with them and how that's gonna work. And then after that, we'll start looking at these different venues and planning the event. Um, I think right now we're looking at maybe that first weekend of February, um, but we're really not sure on the dates. And I think we want to be careful about setting expectations about the date at this point. But we do hope within the next few weeks, we'll have a hotel and a date for you guys because we know you need time to plan your schedules and so forth. Right. So first we thought hey, we did the Deplora Ball, we did the Bull Moose Party, we'll do another event in June. And then we're like, well, that isn't going to happen. And then we said, okay, well, we'll do it end of October. And then once we really got, just for the economics, I'm an open book, you know, I don't, it's a good three, to do it right, it's 300 grand ballpark, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so ballpark is 300,000. So, it, you know, if we're going to throw an event where, you know, it's 25,000 or 50,000, yeah, you know, I'm willing to assume that economic risk and, you know, as long as we come close to breaking even, whatever, that's kind of how we're at the bull moose and like the deplorable. Although the deplorable took cost, cost like a hundred grand. They're, um, I think 111,000 was the final budget on that. But anyway, for 300,000, it's like, well, okay, if it, it, we want to do it right. And if it costs $300,000 to do it right, and it might be a little bit more than that, then we would then we needed that advanced lead time so now we're talking about what like february 2nd february 3rd ish yeah but i don't i want to i want to not set expectations about the date right. because the venues for this size of event we're looking at a thousand to fifteen hundred people the, there aren't that many venues and they get booked up way in advance so we're not exactly sure uh, about the date right now we would like to do it maybe in february about a month before uh, CPAC takes place, but but we're really not sure. So I don't want to create any expectations. But as soon as we get that event contract and nail down the, the venue and have a date, we're going to let you guys know so that you guys can plan your schedules and see if it works out for you. Yeah, exactly right. We definitely aren't going to say, okay, it's February 2nd, buy your plane ticket now kind of thing. I'm just kind of telling you what we're thinking right now in real time, what the timeline is, because you know, here's what we were we were sort of thinking about is that we know that I talked to a lot of people. I went to CPAC, my first ever CPAC, and most people I talked to said, oh, yeah, we come here every year, but it actually kind of sucks. The only reason we come here is because it's really the only game in town. And then I thought, well, hey, I don't like these people. I don't like CPAC. I think they're all terrible people, and they're anti-Trump, and they did everything they could to stop Trump. So if I can plan an event – that's better than CPAC and completely destroy CPAC, then you're speaking my language now. And I can give people a good event to attend. And so we want to make it a yearly, like a destination. People are thinking, wow, that was so great. And yeah. Can't hey, Mike, really quickly, people were asking about this picture. So I got this at a, a charity photo auction. It's a Thai orphan. Um, kickboxer, but I'm going to move it over here because I think it's triggering people. Um, 
and I, I like the imagery of fierceness, but given this crowd, it looks a little too, <laughs> you know, a little too pro or something. So I need to get, get that out of there. Well, I, you know, I, I, I had to take down some of my art downstairs, you know, because they're, you know, live by the spirit cooking, die by the spirit cooking. <laughs> exactly. If we look at Podesta's art and we're like, whoa, that's creepy. I kind of got to check my own space again. You know, we're to be careful with <laughs> what's in the back there. Right. So we want to do a big kind of um, event. And, the, and, and by the way, leave your comments. Tell me in your um, Periscope, what do you see? Have you ever been to CPAC? What would you like to see in an event? The same thing, we're reading the YouTube um, comments. And in terms of what we're looking for, just to kind of set the discussion, I don't need any advice on what I should do or shouldn't do. What we want to hear is what do you want? And there's a difference because, you know, Jeff and I, we've both done executive coaching and, you know, yada, yada. I don't want to get into that too much right now. But the way you ask a question frames a discussion. And if I say, hey, what's your advice for me? Then you start thinking about, well, Cernovich's perspective. So I don't want you to give me or Jeff advice on what we should do. What we want to hear from you is, what would you like to see? What events should we have? Who do you want to see? What would get you off of your butts onto a plane to take a day or two off of work to fly out to D.C.? We want to hear what you want. That's sort of the way the discussion is going right now. Yeah, so let's just kick it off there and just ask, like, who do you want there? Like, who's who's the dream list of people um, you'd like to speak at or participate in the event? So, you know, some of the names that we've talked about, Mike, I'm just going to go ahead and share. We've talked about Peter Thiel. We've talked about Caleb, the Black Swan author. Yeah. We've talked about, you know, lots of people like that. Um, who's the Canadian professor at Toronto? Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Um, even then some different, you know, people like Stexon Hammer has an interesting YouTube channel. A lot of people like him. Uh, so we really want to make it, you know, a, a big tent crowd that blends a lot of the kind of online movement stuff that we have and, and, and some of the more, more mainstreamish folks, but who think in similar ways that we do. Yeah, we want, I mean, we want legitimate intellectuals. Which isn't to say, for example, Stephen Molyneux was a legitimate intellectual. So I'm not, and I'm in many ways an internet celebrity, so I'm not um, denigrating internet celebrities. But in terms of who we want, you know, I want, like, I'll show you what I want. Like, people are always saying, Cernovich, you need to have debates, you need to talk to some people. So I'm like, okay, where's your book? You know, everybody's telling me there's all these intellectuals. And I'm like, okay, I've written, you know, three books. And... I, you know, I, these are who we want, legitimate intellectuals who have ideas about the world and aren't, they actually have some kind of accomplishment behind them. It isn't just, oh, okay, this guy, so-and-so is an internet celebrity or so-and-so is this. We, you know, we want actual real deal players. We also wanted very well-known people like Sheriff Clark. That's kind of, so to, to set your, and by the way, I don't want to say we've got these people yet or anything. So. I want to manage expectations of the sense of what we can do, but Sheriff Clark came to the floor ball. So if his schedule is open, I think we could, you know, get him, I, Roger Stone, a few other people. So I'm just telling you, we're thinking very big. We want not random, you know, random people, actual people of genuine accomplishment. Yeah. And we're reading the comments that you guys are, when you're suggesting people in the comments. So keep those coming. Those are great. Um, who are some interesting, who would be some interesting women to invite to speak? You know, Ann Coulter's on the list, Lauren Southern. Who else do you think would be, who else do you think would be great? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I would, I would like to have, um, well, I mean, it depends on what direction we go and we haven't fully decided yet. And the thing is, we don't want just a, we don't want it to be just political. We also want it to have a broader sort of intellectual an intellectual appeal to it also. So in a sense it would be because, I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. You guys have known this. I am bored. If all people want to talk about our politics all day, for me that's very boring. I like visionary thinkers, legitimate intellectuals, people who have other things going on and don't just want to talk about whatever, the issues of the day that we're supposed to care about that are largely bullshit and just constructed by the media. So I would want somebody like Amy Cuddy, you know, who wrote the great book Presence, or, you know, I'm really um, impo or, um, impossible to ignore 
I'm trying to find that book. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of it, wouldn't it be cool, we could have a persuasion round table and we could have maybe Cialdini, Scott Adams, and maybe um, Carmen Simon, who did Impossible to Ignore, and we could just talk about persuasion. So Cialdini is a Hillary, Hillary guy, an Obama guy. And then we could have a round table where, okay, what is political persuasion? Um, how does political persuasion work? Who, who is doing different things than political persuasion? So it wouldn't just be a thing about, oh, here's politics, and here's our side, your side. It would be more along the lines of, what what moves hearts and minds of American voters, and that would expand the interest of the event considerably. Yeah, it's all about take home value too. You know, it's it's one thing to talk about persuasion in an abstract way, and another another thing to talk about it in terms of, hey, how can we actually persuade the American public to care more about sovereignty and immigration or assimilation policies and stuff like that? Like, how can we put these skills into practice? And so we're really looking for that take home value. And not just uh, theoretical, um, although we want substance, um, but we want to feel like you're part of something, you're building a movement, and this event is a key stake in the ground and something that will be looked at, looked at historically as like, yeah, that was a core element of this movement that's, that's being created and, and, and growing. And so I think, like Mike was saying, we want to make it broad and keep it open and not just purely policy-ish on all topics people have mentioned technology, like the alt tech stuff, you know, some cultural themes and stuff like that. Um, and at the same time, I think it's an opportunity for us to define what, what we really care for. What, what does this stand for? You know, what does this movement actually stand for? What, what does winning mean for us? And what are our non-negotiables? Um, because I think CPAC is just so weak at this point. What does it actually stand for? It's just sort of plain, plain vanilla in, um, in my book, and so I think, um, you know, I think there's a real opportunity here to cast the, the net pretty broadly, but also put some stakes in the ground around our sovereignty, for example, uh, and free speech and issues like that. Oh, and near and dear to your heart, Mike, actually identifying races that we want to, in 2018, where we want to top grade existing Republicans and replace them with, with more Trumpist Republicans. Yeah, th that's kind of another point, too, is I, I think, quite frankly, CPAC is boring and not intellectual. I can't imagine, because uh, one of the games, you know, that we notice going on is I can't imagine a legitimately intellectual thinking person finding a CPAC interesting at all. It's just red meat, rah, 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 kind of cheerleading. That doesn't excite me. And Jeff and I, we're both at the points in our lives where it is – what excites us? What gets us to want to get out of bed in the morning? What kind of event could we put on that we would want to attend? And I just don't want a bunch of like boring Dana Loesch types, woo woo, conservatism, woo woo, empty slogans, Glenn Beck. They're just not interesting people. And that's why in a lot of ways, the media unfairly portrays the right as not being intellectual. But if you go to CPAC, where are the intellectuals? Where are the people talking about big ideas? They have nothing but corny, empty bumper sticker slogans. And, hey, if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. But I don't want another bumper sticker event. I want an event where people are having compelling ideas that they want to think about, that they want to share with other people, and it'll get a conversation going. Yeah, it, it's exactly, that's exactly right. It's, it, in my eyes, it's all about momentum and defining what winning means for us and then, and then really having the event help us make momentum towards that. And winning, in my eyes, is winning some elections in 2018. It's advancing certain issues around like building the wall, assimilation policy, uh, free speech, labeling Antifa as, as domestic terrorists. So it's defining winning in those respects, as well as, you know, maybe it's getting some new institutions and organizations uh, moving. For example, a grassroots or a organization for this movement, a massive database or a think tank or, you know, all the kinds of other stuff that we've talk, talked about. And I think one thing, my, you know, Mike and I, we, we both share this view that there's no one person in charge of this movement. This is a messy, organic, open source insurgency style movement. And, and so a lot of the magic just happens by bringing people together 
and letting it, you know, and, and sparks fly and you never know what's really going to come out of that. And I think that's pretty awesome too. Yeah. And I guess another kind of point too, is I don't want to pander to the left and to, you know, I don't want to go mainstream, you know, I am who I am, but I do want to hold an event where there are certain free thinking liberals and left wing people who would feel like, okay, that's an event where I would go on a panel. That is the kind of event where I could see myself sharing a different point of view without selling out. And I actually think that's possible. I think that we should be having more panel discussions. And, and that would also set the tone of, well, Evergreen, for example, University is a great example where uh, Eric Weinstein, you know, he works at Teal Capital. He's a left-wing liberal guy. And his brother's a biology professor who is actually an anti-racist. And he goes, hey, I don't think this idea of kicking white people off a campus for a day is really a good thing to do. It probably shouldn't happen. Death threats, craziness, carnage, the faculty is being attacked. So I want people like the Weinsteins to think, oh, yeah, I mean, we could actually come to this event and maybe be on a panel and maybe talk to people who are going to be who are going to be sensible and willing to have a discussion. And a discussion does mean back and forth. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're thinking past the sale. We're we're picturing building this as the new right. I mean, we want to take over the right in this country and help build the future of it, not be something looking towards the past or the 50s, but something that's actually really forward looking and stronger and more, you know, more American nationalist, I think, than what we have now. So um, I definitely agree. We want to start to bring more people in the fold, have have some different perspectives reflected at the at the at the event. I'm I'm curious, Mike. I mean, you seem open to having people a little bit more center left um, participate. What about to the right of us? No, because they'll fuck it up. Um, it's just really that simple. You can't have Sheriff Clark come in and then wonder if there's going to be some retards throwing Nazi salutes. You know, that's the unfortunate thing about these guys who. You know, I'm not afraid of anybody's ideas, but the reality is that there, there will be media at our event. And some of these people are so desperate to get on in the Washington Post that the media will go, a couple guys will throw a Nazi salute, and then the whole story is going to be, oh, a Nazi event. And then I kind of think of it like this. A lot of, our, a lot of the people who are going to come to the event are working people, where taking a day or two off is like a big deal. And they're going to tell their friends, hey, I'm going to this event in D.C. I'm going to talk to these Trump supporters and have these great conversations and have all these ideas. This is going to be amazing. And then I imagine them coming to work on Monday, and then their coworkers are like, oh, so you went to that, like, Nazi thing? You went to that event where people were throwing, you know, Nazi salutes and everything? And then that becomes the whole narrative of the event, and that's how you yes. kill an event. So, so what about ideas. It's the behavior uh, of people who are just so desperate to do anything that they'll, you know, dance like puppets for the media. So somebody recommended, so let's, let's take a case study because I, I, you know, I don't have a strong point of view on this, but I don't think it's an easy question. Let's pretend like we wanted to have a, a panel discussion on, you know, demographics in the U.S. and have different perspectives there. Somebody like Jared Taylor is further to the right than we are. He's more of a white nationalist intellectual he's not going to be throwing Nazi salutes or playing games. And yet he does have his perspective on those issues that I think is a voice that some people you know, may want to hear or may want to have represented in addition to other voices, you know, on that. Would you be willing to have somebody like that on a panel or do you just think that's a bad idea as well? well I mean, there, there are people like Steve Saylor who legitimately have an insight and they have a point of view and there aren't, so yeah, let me be clear. The issue is that, oh my God, I'm afraid of having Jared Taylor or Steve Saylor on a panel. That's not the issue. The issue is our people, and, and we're going to have party crashes anyway, right? So there are going to be people who are going to try to come in and crash the party and we'll have a plan for that anyway. So yeah, the issue is that with somebody like Steve, Ta uh, Steve Saylor, who I think has interesting ideas and people should talk to, and I think people should debate him. Same way with Jared Taylor, a very civilized guy. And actually, Jared Taylor was, he's against all that Nazi, you know, salute nonsense anyway. So, yeah, the, the issue is less about the ideas. And the issue is, you know, how do you deal with the desperate people who are just going to come in and, you know, try to, to get free, you know, media coverage looking like idiots? So, yeah, it, that's not the issue. The panel is if, if there was something, 
that we could do to keep away the party crashers and the people who want to discredit the movement. And, and that's something that we're just going to have to figure out. You know, what do we do? That's, that, that's, that's how I, I think that's why I land too. Like I'm not afraid of different ideas on a panel being represented, even ones that I may disagree with or that further to the right than where we are. I think we should actually invite that and be open to it. What I do have no tolerance for is if the behavior is unpredictable, if there's you know foul language or that's really offensive language or any games that are played, that I have zero tolerance for. But having well-articulated ideas um, on a panel that I don't necessarily agree with, whether that's from the right of me or from the left, um, I'm, I'm open to that. And I hope we can kind of create create a little bit of that climate, although I think it, you know, I think there are definitely challenges like we're talking about. So anyway, uh, just for the audience, these are the kinds of questions that Mike and I have been you know, wrestling with as we, uh, as we envision this event. Well, yeah, in a way I view, I view the same, because a lot of people go, oh, Cernovich, you're triggered by a Nazi salute. And it's like, guys, this is such a boring conversation. I'm not triggered any more than if the left wing person came in blowing a whistle and saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. It's just disruptive. Why? I want to have an event where people can just come in, have a conversation, things are civil. So if somebody comes in with a megaphone, you know, screaming Black Lives Matter, and I say, I don't want that shit in here. Well, that isn't because I'm triggered by Black Lives Matter. It just means that that isn't the time and place to do it. Go have your own event, right? Well, Black Lives Matter people should have their own thing. So you're right. It's, it's not a right-wing thing, too, if – if left-wing people want to come in and disrupt the event, then that is also a problem. I, I like this comment. Social Piranha, Piranha, says, for your first event, play it safe, or it'll be hard to get another event the following year. So that's a great point. I mean, because our vision is for this to repeat, to be an event that's year after year after year. So we want to balance that and kind of playing it safe while at the same time being different and differentiating from CPAC and having some teeth and a little bit more edge, I think. That's, well, the, yeah, that's, that's, a, the, that's a challenge. And that's what happened with the deplorable and all the deplorable drama, which was that we had been no platform from the Claritin, and then we got into the press club, and then people were doing things that could get us no platform from the press club, and then we're for no platform, that's it. Then there's no event. Right. So it's easy for people to criticize us and our decision making and, you know, call people and call me a cuck all day. I don't care. I've been called way worse than that. But they're not the ones who are actually putting down signing the contracts. They're not the ones who it's their ass and their loss if they do it. And quite frankly, I think it's sociopathic to cool. not realize like, hey, dude, people are and maybe that's just like my working class background. People are going to take off work. They're going to be excited to come to this. They don't want to have to come back to the office on Monday and have to have an awkward conversation because people gave the fake news media a bad narrative. Yeah, I think it's about striking the right balance. I mean, I'm reading the comments, and I think people have, I think it's both a good point to say, you know, it's a first year played a little bit is safe. And I think it's also a good point to say, you know what, guys, don't play it safe. Like, that's what this is, that's what makes CPAC boring is that they don't play it safe. And I think the deplorable is a good example because we found that happy e medium where, it was still pretty edgy, and yet it, it, we pulled it off, right? So yeah, I think there was I a think, lot. Of, yeah, they didn't see all the drama. I mean, yeah. So for your audience, like, I, like, let's be very clear. This we're not going to play it safe in terms of plain old boring Republican stuff that you can find at CPAC or anywhere else. Um, we're we we do play play it safe just in terms of you know behavioral standards and just trying to make make sure the experience is one that people will feel good about and positive about attending. And that also if we're getting prominent speakers and stuff like that, that they're going to want to be part of uh, this time and in the future. Yeah, exactly right. So yeah, we, we're not going to do basic, basic bitch boring, but I mean, you know, the deplorable stuff, you guys saw the drama that you guys saw, which looked like a lot of drama. That was like 10%. What, you know, so anybody who remembers the deplorable and that will blow up. That was 10% of the drama. So th the least fun part of this is the drama that goes behind it, the hurt egos, the people who are mad, and the people who are you know crying about it. But it, it ultimately comes down to this, which is that if people don't like our event, they should just do another event. I don't like CPAC. I thought it was boring. I don't like the, the traditional boring basic bitch GOP. 
I don't like that at all. So I want to make an event that's not boring. But what I can foresee happening are people who can't throw big events, you know, want to come in and pull stunts and dance for the media stuff. So, again, it all comes back to the Nazi salute. I was fine with everybody. I was Mr. Big Tent, Mike Cernovich, Big Tent, all day, every day, didn't care. Everybody come. This is fantastic. The more the merrier. People can argue and everything. And then when I see Nazi salutes and that becomes the entire story of, you know, events. And then I'm like, these idiots are going to try to come to the deplorable and do it. And as a matter of fact, some of them were. There were people who they planned on coming in to do Nazi salutes. And then I put the word out that I will fuck you up. Like, you, I will physically beat the fuck out of you if you come to my event and fuck with it. But I shouldn't have to do that. If people want to do a Nazi salute, they should have their own events. Same, and the same thing we had on the left of us. We had people, we had to go to court, criminal court. We had people on the left want to put butyric acid in the ventilation system to cause a stampede of people, including pregnant women, to hurt. And then we have these other people trying to do it. So I don't understand why people can't just show up to an event and not talk about fucking chicks, you know, cussing and throwing Nazi salutes. To me, it isn't that ideas are too controversial. It's just an issue of like, hey, if this isn't like the right venue, be a little bit more civil, watch the cussing, you know, watch the foul language, watch the talk about, you know, sexual things and other things. And it isn't that I'm opposed to people talking about sex, but, you know, if, people, if we're having a panel discussion, I don't want to have to wonder if the guy on the panel discussion is drunk and is going to talk about, like, having sex. Yeah, and in a weird way, I mean, I'm, I'm almost ready to move beyond the policing topic because we, we've covered that pretty well, and I want to I wanna build something really positive and good. It doesn't mean we don't, you know, we don't have to think about the policing side of it. We do, so I'm very practical about that. But let's talk about the positive side of it and, and build up the vision a little bit more. Yeah, which is the po – well, I, I know, I hate, the I hate the policing stuff too. But the issue is the – you, you love it, dude. You like the drama. No, I don't. But <laughs> if I get fired up, I like conflict, but I'd rather have conflict with my enemies and not people that I could, you know, they could be in their lane and I could be in mine. But the, the positive and negative in life are always linked because, to me, I want an event that Don Jr., Sheriff Clark, Nassim Talib, you know, uh, Eric Weinstein, Dave Rubin, I want an event where they can come to. That would be the positive. Sheriff Clark, right? Yeah, and we're hiring a professional event management company. I mean, we may. We'll, we'll review this contract, but they're incredibly professional. They, they do these events all the time. And so, you know, uh, you know, we're still in the early days of doing events, Mike and I. Um, but we want to get to the point where we don't even have to think about this stuff because we've just gone that much more professional in our, in our approach. Um, SWOT analysis, though. I mean, SWOT. What's that? I mean, we're always getting back to, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. You know, they're always, yeah. though, the minute people, because I even think about Jeff, because Jeff thinks I'm paranoid in a lot of ways because I'm always like, I called him actually last week and I go, you know, Jeff, things are going good for me now. I'm really on an upward arc. How are they going to take me down? You know, let's game it out. How, you know, he's like, Mike, I, I think you've been through it all. But I'm always thinking uh, because I've had everything taken from me before. Those are fun discussions, too. I mean, we war game that a little bit. I gave you some possible attacks on Mike Cernovich. <laughs> exactly. so, so I do I do think a lot about the potential threats because, man, I mean, if you think about it, General Flynn, three-star general, Going in, national security advisor, and the media scalp him. So I'm always just thinking, you know, I'm always thinking about the threats. But, yeah, the, the positive vision that we've talked about is, you know, we want community. We want connection. We want to have, you know, a great cocktail hour. We want to have great speakers. We want to have people learn things. We even talked about a, you know, like a you. I want to do, like, YouTube panel stuff. So if we could get, like, Paul Joseph Watson, Stefan Molyneux, uh, you know, some big YouTubers, then people who want to go in and start a YouTube channel could learn like the nuts and bolts. How do you shoot a video? How long should a video be? What would lighting be? You know, I could talk about, you know, journalism. We could get, you know, Jim Hoff, you know, other people. So it would be, we could have some intellectual big idea conversations on the future of the right and which way the right's going to go. And then we could have some very sort of 
nuts and bolts kind of conversations. What kind of microphone should you buy? What kind of webcam? And then that would be a value add too for, I think, the younger people. Now, what, what were we thinking about? What else were we thinking? Yeah, I mean, there's the possibility for this scale event of having different tracks. So there could be a track on like kind of activism with more training. Uh, there could be a track on technology and stuff like that. And there could be another, you know, so there could be two or three different tracks with different nuts and bolts panel discussions. And then, uh, you know, and then events that everybody goes to. So, but as of right now, I think the way we're thinking about it is Friday, you show up, you register, get in your hotel. We have a cocktail reception that night. Do your own thing for dinner, network, you know, be relaxed, have fun. Saturday, hit the ground running, get your coffee, come show up at the event. And then we have, you know, a keynote and then breakout panels, um, break for lunch, then, uh, then more panels and breakout, you know, breakout sessions. So Saturday is kind of a big day. And then Saturday night, a gala dinner or people do their own thing, just depending on how we structure that. Um, and then Sunday, basically a half to three quarters day of more panels and keynotes and kind of finish up that day. Um, and we want to leave breathing room for people to be able to connect and have fun and have that, because that's where the magic happens, not just during the panel and event stuff. It's, it's, it's meeting that person in the elevator or over a cocktail. Um, you know, that's, so we want to foster that kind of environment where, where people can, uh, can meet and maybe you know, maybe uh, Saturday night after the dinner, they go, people go to the Trump Hotel and grab a cocktail there, that kind of thing. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, we're thinking Friday night would be early bird registration, cocktail hour kind of. Would we host that or would that meet somewhere else? So we would host that. That might be a co – so, you know, Mike and I, we've talked about this before. We're trying to keep tickets down – as low as possible and even having reduced rates for students or people under 25 and then have a couple different tiers if people want to help make the event possible and contribute you know we want to create create that opportunity as well so uh, more likely than not the opening night reception maybe you'll get one drink ticket or maybe it'll just be cash bar just depends on the economics as we run the numbers of this um, but we want to make it a, the event really affordable for people as well as fun so the first night would be, you know, a cocktail reception. Everybody arrives, have fun, relax, get, get some drinks. There'll be hors d'oeuvres there. Maybe you just graze on those, or maybe you meet up with friends and go out to dinner after that, um, that kind of thing. Right, but it would be, because I'm always thinking value prop. So Friday would be, if people want to come in early, like they can come meet everybody and meet with each other. That would be, you would be there, I would be there, other people would be there. Yeah, Friday's not even early. The official registration would begin Friday afternoon. Gotcha. Yeah, and then if, so, if people don't arrive until Saturday, that's fine. They can just kind of register Saturday morning. Okay. Um, yeah, but we would kick off the, you know, maybe we would have been Friday night, and this is just what I've spreadsheeted out. So Mike and I, you know, we, we can talk about this more and our vision may evolve. Um, but yeah, there might be like an opening keynote Friday night and then, a, you know, a welcome opening keynote and then, um, you know, and then a cocktail reception, um, get the ball rolling going into the weekend. And if people can make it there, so if you might want to take off half the day on Friday um, or if you're local, you know, come a little bit early and, um, and join us then. So who was, so for those of you watching, what do you think? So those of you watching at home, we know security, we know about, we, the pro, that's the good thing about the deplorable. We're like, we know how to deal with the Antifa now. Security, yeah, <laughs> we're like, we're like old hats when it comes to that stuff now because we had, um, we had a real baptism by fire where it wasn't like a little protest here or there. We had full on domestic terrorism coming in. We had baptism by literal fire. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, we had the security thing we got kind of done. Um, big speakers, we talked about, we kind of game theoried out, not game theoried out, but we brainstormed who would be like the 10 gets that we think would be hard to get, right? So those of you who are watching on Periscope or YouTube, think of three people that you would want to see there, but that you think would be hard to get there. 
So I'll give you an example. I would say I would like Don Jr. to be there, but that's hard to get. I would like Kelly and Conway to be there, hard to get. So in that regard, you know, don't say I want to see Mike Cernovich there because, you know, that's easy. Or I want to see, you know, so-and-so there. Who is somebody that you want to see? Yeah, Peter Thiel, people are saying. Right. Peter Thiel, we'd like to have there. Not easy to get Peter Thiel to show up. His people are risk averse, and you know, but he did come to the floor ball for 10 or 15 minutes before he was harassed by the fake news people. Newt Gingrich, that's a good one. Yeah, Newt Gingrich is another. He would be, we'd like to get him. He would be hard to get. Laura Ingraham, that's another one. Yeah, Nigel, yeah, exactly. So these are the names that are especially helpful. These are great suggestions, guys. So thank you very much. I, I just wanted to highlight Mike um, from S. Darling said theme is New Rights version of the Bilderberg. Think bigger than CPAC. <laughs> we I thought it was a yeah. pr pretty timely comment given that uh, Bilderberg is happening this weekend. So yeah, in a sense, uh, we're, we're not trying to build a globalist conspiracy group uh, here necessarily, but I do think that's a great comment in the sense that we are trying to build. Uh, a powerful movement and force that can help take over the right and build the future of this country. And, um, and so we want to bring people together to do that. So in that sense, it is like the builder. We, we do want it like the Bilderberg in the sense that we want to take political power and help, help, um, you know, build the future of the country. And, yeah, uh, as far as Bilderberg goes, I think Jeff can kind of read between the lines, but a lot of people can't. If you'll notice, I haven't said much about Bilderberg pro and con, and there's a reason for that is, in my view, and I know this by talking to, you know, I'm not going to name names, Bilderberg actually isn't anything anymore. They don't really have the power that people think they have. But a lot of my friends really think it's a big deal, so they're like, oh, my God, Bilderberg, Bilderberg. So I don't want to say it's not a big deal because that would make my friends look like they're chasing, you know, a dragon that doesn't exist. But the flip side, my personal view is Bilderberg, and I know this from, from, you know, a lot of people. It isn't quite what people think it is. And in fact, somebody had told me, was like, hey, what is the next Bilderberg? Because Bilderberg, it's not really shit anymore. Yeah, exactly. We Out with the old, in with the new. I mean, we want to build new our own power institutions and vehicles. Um, so that's what this event's about. And it's going to repeat year after year after year. And um, which actually brings up another question for us to discuss maybe, Mike, which is, the brand. <laughs> what do we call this event? And I know you and I, we've talked about it and we, we go through little phases and we both care about the brand. Uh, it would be interesting to see what the audience thinks. Now, hopefully nobody will go out and buy the domains that we're mentioning. <laughs> but um, what are your thoughts on the brand at this point, Mike? Yeah, so Jeff and I, we'd initially talked about brand and we kind of agreed that we well there's two things one is you know we could potentially launch a new actual legitimate think tank from this which could be its own brand for the venue though if you think about it like davos right what davos is like the city they meet in but what is a davos brand so we were just kind of thinking like aspire things that would not you wouldn't even know that it was necessarily you wouldn't even necessarily know that it was a political kind of thing it would be something much bigger and broader and we're not going to use aspire so that was just kind of an example that we were talking about yeah and I'm, I'm curious what what do you guys think about putting america first in the name of it for example the america first congress or america first coalition and then then there would be initials like afc do you think the america first in the brand is a good idea or is that a bad idea yeah, good question, people. What are your? I go back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I personally am not keen on it because I feel like that's a, a present rather than a future, mm -hmm. and I feel it's a little bit more concrete rather than abstract. I like general when it comes to branding. I like very broad, where you almost don't even know what it is for an event like this. But the the there's some pros and cons to that. The, yeah. pro, the pro of America First is like everybody gets it right away. You have built-in brand value. Everybody gets it. You don't have to explain to people what it is. Right. Well, plus, you know, nobody knows what CPAC stands for. It could evolve to the initials. So I totally agree with you on all those points, by the way. So I personally go a little bit back and forth on it. Um, it's sort of like 
I mean, you know who has a good brand? And speaking of, you know, overlapping with controversial characters, I think American Renaissance is like a beautiful brand, which is <laughs> Taylor's thing, right? With I, Amran, you know, American Renaissance, I think that is like a beautiful, beautiful brand. And that would, that's like, and it's kind of a fun brand, but what is Amran? What is, because you want, with a brand, you want people to both understand and not understand. And Amran is a great idea. So if you would say American Renaissance, well, everybody kind of knows what the Renaissance is. It was an awakening, a, a new way of viewing things. So it was America's version. But then people go, like, what is that? I agree. I mean, I think it's good to have abstract brands that we can kind of define that are, you know, ha are somewhat literal. And America First has all kinds of baggage, good and bad, associated with it. So it's probably not the direction I think we'll end up going, you know, based on our conversations and even the feedback here. Although it's compelling in some ways, you know, it's like America's Future. There, there might be some other generic names like that that mean something that we could initial put initials around, or we could just come up with a new name, like somebody just said, America Reborn. That's pretty awesome. Right. Good job, Matt Kills, thank you. Right. Uh, forward America is, is cool too. I like how forward looking that is. That's awesome. Yeah, or even, you know, even for example, like and speaking of branding, you know, it's a little played out now, but even like Phoenix, right? You know, Phoenix has been overused, but you could do like a political, you could do like a political brand just Phoenix and then you, I can even see it in my head. That wouldn't work for this, but I'm saying that's like another where everybody kind of gets that a Phoenix is a new rebirth out of something that's dead, but what does it actually mean within that context? So that is one of those where it's abstract and you kind of get it, but then it leads you on wanting asking more questions. And it takes a long time, like American Revival. Yeah, American, people are liking these America yeah. Reborn, America Revival, interesting. Yeah, American Revolt, right? There's, you know. I mean, okay, here's another branding issue. So we we have some support international folks watching this, right? So it's not, I mean, obviously our focus is political power in America. And yet we all recognize this movement's bigger than America. It's throughout the West and, and shows up in different parts of the world. So how do you think about in branding in terms of, do we explicitly make it an American thing or do we keep it a little bit more open? What are your thoughts? Me personally? Yeah. I mean, me personally, you know, I, I want a, a big tent kind of thing. Like me personally, the hard thing, the hard, the real challenge for me with an event like this is that we have all of this like built in juice and all this built in cash it. And you don't, you don't ruin that by making a big tent right away. You want to start off small tent. But I, I, I want to have like the kind of event where, well, sort of how the Federalist Society was. That's kind of a good model. The Federalist Society was an ostensibly right wing, conservative, textualist, Antonin Scalia type organization. But if you wanted to have a real debate and you wanted to hear, you would have little speakers. So you, the Federalist Society would say, hey, we're going to invite a speaker to come in who's going to tell us all why we're like completely full of shit. And then we're going to have you ask questions to tell them why. That's kind of how I see it is where we do have an agenda. We do have a point of view. But people who want to come in who maybe are on the left want to come in and tell us why we're full of shit. We're saying, hey, man, you know, come on in. Let's have a debate. Let's talk about it. And that's where you can expand your influence, too. Right. And, and maybe what we do, I mean, my thought is just keep it focused on America for now, but, be, but have a big tent. So if Nigel Farage wants to come speak or Marine Le Pen, awesome, let's do that. Um, new, somebody just said new right something. Uh, could be like new right America or... Yeah, there are lots of good ideas here, guys. So keep them coming. These, this is really getting getting the juices flowing. Well, and then speaking of people who are expert at persuasion, they uh, um, a meme strictly from the Russian propaganda was new nationalism, which was an about an alliance between Russia and Le Pen, France, and then America. And when Jeff and I actually saw that meme surface, I started trolling a little bit by saying I support new nationalism. But as it turns out. The people who are hysterical about Russia are such dumbasses and they're so illiterate that they didn't actually know that I was giving them a real reference to the Kremlin because they don't really know anything about Russia or any of the things that actually surface. So, you know, new nationalism is, again, not right for our event. 
that that is something that I like. Yeah, a lot of these ideas have this theme of reborn, rebirth, renaissance, rising. I'm seeing that a lot in the ideas. So people seem to, that seems to resonate, that theme. Yeah, that, um, yeah, people like that, the new, uh, that's why we went with like the new right kind of for the brand and it's sticking now. You know, Vice even did an article, you know, what is the gym routines of the new right? So that, and, and a lot of people, interesting whenever you talk about brand, a lot of people go, you can't use the new right. They use that in Europe and blah, blah, blah. But it was new to people in America. So a lot of people have actually, you know, latched onto that and really liked that brand, you know, the new right. People do like that. So they, they really did one on the, the gym habits of the new right? Yeah, Vice did. They're, um, you know, they're like, yeah, they asked me what my, um, you know, workout routine was or whatever like that. They asked Lucian. Lucian, I'll text you the article. I mean, how awesome is that? I mean, this movement, the fact that the media wants to write articles about your gym routine, I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, and yet, it's such a great opportunity, I think, for us related to this event and this movement in the sense that we're on to something, guys. And there is something in the air and the universe and happening in the country that's happening that wants this event to happen, wants us to you know, crystallize this movement and make meaningful progress. And the media is all over it. And so I think when, you know, I think that that media interest and that kind of feeling of the tide being on our side, these are opportunities that we need to really kind of pounce on, Mike. And I'm excited for, for the event in that respect, you know, just PR wise. And, um, I, you know, I think we're both mindful about, of, you know, t seizing these opportunities. Yeah, that's why we wanted it earlier rather than sooner is we wanted to, you know, keep the momentum going. The Kathy Griffin thing showed us that the people are still out there and they just need something to do, right? Right. And and that would be like the big event. So, yeah, I, I'm not really – yes, I sent you a link to that article, I, which I thought was kind of fun. I think it's sort of – Before it, you, before I got on, I was watching, you know, I was like, Mike, you're sounding like Kathy Griffin. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> My life, the drama. The drama, <laughs> yeah. Me, me and Kathy Griffin, you know, Kendra kind of spirits. Well, there's drama now. You. Speaking of which, there's drama now amongst, you know, certain people about the, the people who would go to the rallies. Now they're fighting over money and stuff. So the drama that I created was quite Machiavellian. I don't want to go off on too much of a digression. The drama that I created served a purpose. It drew a line of demarcation. I said, I wanted people to call me new right. Okay, then I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to make a clean split to where people recognize there's this movement out now there. It's called the new right, and it's different from everybody else. And now there's this – so that's the value prop. So I wish we could do an earlier event, but it's just not going to be able to happen. Maybe, I don't know, a smaller one. I'm not really sure about that. Can we talk, can we talk about the Paris Agreement for a minute? Yeah. So just to shift gears a little bit, and, and I think this maybe speaks to why, why our movement, why this movement is so important, which is, you know, the Paris Agreement. At first, my first instinct was, you know, hey, I care about the environment. Trump is making a mistake. You know, I follow international affairs. Trump is making a mistake. Then I asked, then I started looking into it. And I researched it. I said, what are the, why is this a disaster, people? Like, what's so bad about this? And just kind of kept an open mind. And the more I looked into the Paris Agreement, the more I realized this thing is just all, like, it's fake. It's this fake agreement that actually doesn't do anything. It's completely toothless. It costs a lot of money. It's these, you know, Europeans who are being all legalistic and stuff, um, holding it over our head. It makes us feel like we're actually doing something for the environment that's good when in fact it probably holds us back from doing other better stuff. Um, and the arguments that people were making on the Paris Agreement were just completely ridiculous. Um, one argument was, you know, we should be diplomatic leaders in the world and, you know, we're failing. And what, you know, I think there's a counter argument to that. Leaders actually don't always follow the crowd. Trump right. is resetting relationships with America uh, and the world and that's, that's fantastic. And then the other argument is, well, if we don't do it, the world's going to end and weather is going to increase and all this kind of stuff. And the consequences are really dire. And the more you dig into that, the more I realized, you know, 
these ex a it's like infinitesimal b these expert predictions quote unquote um you know there's a track record of failed expert predictions uh around this stuff and and i just realized there's so much more hysteria around the paris agreement than than not we're living in this world of like where globalists manufacture consent around stupid things like the paris agreement and then Trump rejecting it causes all kinds of world is going to end hysteria and it's just not it's kind of insane right and th that's a great point and that's why we want to have offensive people to talk about it once I went looked into the Paris Accord actually and found out that most of it is bullshit it doesn't affect any of the real issues in our environment like um, the, the fish supplies are being killed overfishing is a problem the actual real issue is the plastic there's all this like pl plastic all over the ocean, huge, massive, none of that's addressed. All it would have been was a bailout for Elon Musk and big industry, and that's why they were all triggered. It was a total corporate giveaway. And then I even looked Heritage, you know, because I, you know, I criticize Heritage, so I will give them a shout out when they do good work. The, according to all the research of the people who supported it, if everybody did everything in the agreement in 100 years, it would at most prevent the temperature by rising by 0.2 degrees, not 2 degrees, 0.2 degrees Celsius. That's what all this bullshit was over. So you realize the Paris Agreement was actually a major scam that accomplished nothing. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty insane. Okay, so I, I found out that I have, to, I have to get a haircut. Okay, closing, closing words, Jeff, my hair appointment. So here's your challenge for your, your listeners. This weekend, the Paris Agreement, people are going to talk about it. What, what I recommend doing is just asking people, hey, why is this going to be so damaging to the world that we backed out? And just genuinely listen to what they say. Nine times out of ten, they're going to say, it's, it's damaging because it's, it's, it's damaging. And if it's not obvious to you, then, then you're an idiot. And that's the level of argument that, they're gonna, that you're probably going to hear maybe one out of 10 people will have a good substantial one. So that's a good question just to ask people over the weekend is what do you guys, you know, what do you, what's so damaging about pulling out of the Paris agreement? Just ask it very innocently and see what people say. Exactly. And, and it, I imagine at the event, we will actually have a panel discussion on how to have disagreements where you can learn how to ask those kind of questions without yeah, everybody having a heart attack. Okay, so I got to go. Okay, enjoy your haircut. Thanks for having right, me on. Okay. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. All right, thanks for tuning in. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Next time you see me, I'll have a better haircut.